Bo would like to clarify that our live streams will never ask anyone to register and give credit card details. We bring these live streams to the public for free. If you come across an MVO live stream that asks you to pay for it, it is a false stream and we ask that you report it. Thank you. If a child in the family wants to ask a question during MBO's live stream, it's best to have an adult ask it through their Facebook or YouTube account. This ensures the child's safety and adherence to platform age restrictions while allowing them to participate in a supervised manner. Thank you. Tonight we discuss the benefits of space exploration and the resulting inventions that have transformed our lives. NASA has been credited with inventing many of them, but did they? Really? Let's investigate in this prologue, NASA Invention, Fact or Fiction? Did NASA invent veggie burgers? Fiction. In 2009, NASA funded research on extremophiles in Yellowstone National Park looking for biofuels. They discovered the Fusarium train Flavolapi, a microbe that can be grown into a complete protein and a reproducible food source for astronauts. Partnering with NASA, Nature's Find has used this Phi protein to develop a range of vegan foods for Earth dwellers including burgers and cream cheese. Did NASA invent Teflon? Fiction. NASA didn't invent Teflon. That was DuPont in 1938. NASA, however, uses Teflon in spacesuits, heat shields, and to protect spacecraft components, including on the Mars rovers. Did NASA invent the cochlear implant? Fact. Adam Kisea, a NASA engineer with a hearing disability, patented with NASA his cochlear implant design in 1977. The implant's 22 electrodes replaced the function of hair cells, producing sounds as a pattern of electrical impulses. Did NASA invent Fiction. NASA didn't invent Tang. That was General Foods in 1957, but the astronaut John Glenn did drink it in space in 1962, and astronaut Jim Lovell advertised it in a 1975 TV commercial, giving it a big tangy marketing boost. Did NASA invent light-emitting diodes? Fiction. LED lights were invented by General Electric in 1962. NASA, however, researched the benefits of using LEDs for growing plants in space, wound treatment and sleep therapy. Astronauts now use LED lights to replace the day and night cues of the sun, balancing their circadian rhythms. The use of color to induce sleep and wakefulness is now used in many products, including smartphones and glasses. Did NASA invent ultrasound? Fiction. NASA, however, has developed the Butterfly IQ ultrasound for use in zero gravity. In partnership with Wind Focus, 
NASA's Advanced Diagnostic Ultrasound in Microgravity, or ADAM project, invented protocols and techniques for remote ultrasound that are now used by physicians and hospitals all over the world. Did NASA invent invisible dental braces? Although NASA didn't invent Invisalign, it was invented by two Stanford students. Clear Align orthodontic devices are based on a transparent ceramic. Translucent polycrystalline alumina, or TPA, was discovered by NASA while researching ultra-strong polymers to protect radar equipment without diminishing signal transmission. Did NASA invent cordless power tools? Fiction. Cordless power tools had been invented before NASA funded Black & Decker in the 1960s to develop battery-powered equipment to be used in zero-gravity space, including a cordless hammer drill. Black & Decker later developed commercial cordless tools, including medical instruments and the dust buster. Did NASA invent unbreakable sensor robots? Fact. NASA funded research to develop space probes carrying delicate sensors capable of surviving high impact scenarios. Squishy Robotics was formed to commercialize the product and the robots are used in disaster situations including wildfires, bomb diffusal, and to monitor gas leaks and electrical faults. Did NASA invent Velcro? Fiction. NASA didn't invent Velcro. That was a Swiss engineer named George de Mestral in the 1940s. But NASA did use it on Apollo missions in the 1960s in spacesuits and in spacecraft to secure items from floating away in zero gravity. Did NASA invent baby formula? Fiction. NASA didn't invent baby formula, but they did make it more nutritious. NASA funded research in the 1980s on nutritional supplements for astronauts to consume during extended space flights, discovering a microalgae that produces DHA, a vital omega-3 fatty acid. This supplement fortifies the majority of infant formulas worldwide and more recently has been added to pet food and agriculture and aquaculture feed. NASA has developed technologies, funded research, and conducted experiments in space exploration for over 50 years. And the results of this are many everyday technologies that benefit us all. So even though NASA may not have invented them all directly, Without NASA, they may not exist. Find out more by searching for NASA spin-offs on the NASA website. Three, two, one, zero. joining this event from our own location, we would like to acknowledge that we are meeting on the lands of the Wurundjeri people and the Boon Wurrung people of the Southeast Kulin Nation. We would like to pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, and to all First Nations communities joining us today. Hello and welcome everyone to a night at Mount Burnett Observatory. Whether you're tuning in from around the corner or around the world, I want to extend a warm welcome to all of you who have taken the time to join us here tonight. It's great to have such a diverse and engaged audience. As we gather here tonight to explore the marvels of technologies from space, 
in an era where innovation and progress are the driving forces of our world, the advancements that originate beyond the confines of our planet have become integral to shaping our future and have impacted our daily lives. The technologies developed for space exploration have found practical applications in medicine, material science, robotics, and countless other fields, propelling progress across the board. The innovations born of our endeavours beyond Earth's atmosphere have revolutionised how we live, work and connect. This will be presented by some of the MBO panellists who will share their knowledge and insights about these technologies. I'd now like to introduce to you to our panellists who will be presenting tonight. Could you please join me, Jackie, Merv, Neil, Ella, and Chitani. All of us here would like to give a shout out, as always, to our fabulous crew who are working hard behind the scenes on Facebook and YouTube. They too play a big part in bringing this production to you. We also have Jet and Adam, who are our producers for this evening. Throughout the event, we encourage you to engage with one another, ask questions, and share your own insights and experiences in the chat. We have a planosphere to give away tonight to a question that we feel is the best question of the night. Technologies in space have become the bedrock of our modern society. They inspire us, connect us, and empower us to reach new heights. As we embark on this exploration of space technologies, let us marvel at the ingenuity that drives us forward and reaffirm our commitment to nurturing innovation, fostering collaboration, and harnessing the limitless potential that awaits us in the vast expanse of space. My name is Petra, and may our journey into the technologies from space be enlightening and inspiring. First up for tonight's show is Neil. Neil will be presenting the benefits of going to space. Welcome to another night at Mount Burnett Observatory. Tonight, you'll be amazed by the many incredible technological advances that space exploration has brought us, not only in orbit, but also on the ground. But why should we spend so much money and effort on going into space when there are so many problems here on Earth, which that money and effort would be better spent solving? Is it really worth it for a few new tech trinkets and so we can plant flags on the moon or Mars? Well, fortunately, there are many more great benefits to going to the heavens, and the technological ones aren't even the most important. Let's think about some of those for a moment before we continue. Learning about our universe. Studying the stars, planets, and other objects in space helps us learn more about the universe and our place in it. Understanding and visiting asteroids and comets tells us about the formation of the solar system and teaches us where we came from. Looking at Mars and Venus tells us about other possible ways rocky planets can be, and thus, how special it is that the Earth can sustain life. Studying exoplanets, stars and galaxies teach us the story of the universe and how incredibly small but incredibly special we are. Space telescopes like Hubble and Webb expand our understanding of the universe and may even reveal signs that we are not alone in this cosmic ocean. Protecting our planet and environment. Weather satellites have revolutionized our understanding of the atmosphere and the ability to make accurate forecasts about the weather. Countless lives have been saved thanks to early warnings about dangerous storms or cyclones. Today, satellites are used to track weather patterns, monitor deforestation, and map the spread of bushfires. They provide data on climate change, measure pollution, and arm us with the knowledge of how we are affecting the planet and what we need to do to protect it and ourselves into the future. This information can be used to make better decisions about how to manage our planet and its resources. Creating scientific and technical jobs. Space exploration creates jobs in the fields of engineering, science, technology and mathematics. These jobs are well paying, in high demand and they offer many great opportunities. 
The aerospace industry is one of the fastest growing industries in the world. It is estimated that the space industry will create tens of thousands of new jobs over the next decade. In fact, it has been shown that investment in space exploration returns many times its value through economic growth alone. Fostering International Cooperation International collaboration allows countries to share resources and expertise, build trust and understanding, share technology and promote scientific discovery. For example, the International Space Station is a joint project of 15 countries. The ISS has been in orbit for over 20 years and has been used to conduct a wide range of scientific experiments, the benefits of which are shared amongst partner nations. Other huge space projects bring together many nations, such as the Webb Telescope, a collaboration between Europe and the United States, and the Artemis Program, which is a joint project of the United States, Canada, Europe and Japan. This is a very visible way to demonstrate to the people of Earth that when nations put aside their differences and cooperate, rather than compete, we can achieve great things. Inspiring Innovation Space exploration inspires people to think big and to dream of new possibilities. This can lead to innovation in all areas of society, from business to education to the arts. Careers in STEM are vital for humanity to solve the many complex challenges we will face in the 21st century, and attracting more people to study and work in these fields is essential. In the years during and after the Apollo program, student enrollments in STEM subjects increased by 50% in the United States, as well as significant growth around the world, especially among women and minority groups. Inspiring us. However, perhaps the most important benefit of exploring space is the inspiration it brings us all, connecting us to the bigger universe and uniting us in our understanding of how unique and special the Earth is. We've all looked upon the incredible photos from Hubble and Webb in awe. We've cheered on the various space probes as they achieve incredible things, and some have even mourned the end of those missions. Humans are curious and sociable animals. Our exploration of space unites us in our wonder and shows us what we are truly capable of. Thank you, Neil. That was informative and engaging. Next up is Chitani, and he will be explaining to you about GPS. Hi everyone, I am Chaitanya. Welcome to MBO's live event. Today, I am going to talk about an innovation that was initially discovered for the space industry and now we use it in our day-to-day -day life. It is everywhere around us, in our cars, in our phone, in trains, boats, in planes, you name it. It has drastically changed our day-to-day -day life and all of us use it. It is known as GPS, the Global Positioning System. What is GPS? The Global Positioning System is a navigation system that uses a receiver and an algorithm to synchronize location, velocity and time data for air, sea, and land travel. The GPS is made up of the satellite system, consisting of a constellation of 24 satellites in six Earth central orbital planes, each with four satellites orbiting at 20,000 kilometers above Earth and traveling at the speed of 14,000 kilometers per hour. As you can see in this animation, the 24 constellation satellites 
are displayed. The global positioning system is the principal component and operational element of the Global Navigational Satellite System, GNSS. The history of GPS program predates the space age. In 1951, Dr. Ivan Getting designed a three-dimensional positioning finding system based on time difference of arrival of a radio signals. It's known as the Doppler effect. Shortly after the launch of Sputnik, scientists confirmed that the Doppler distortion could be used to calculate ephemeris and conversely it if a satellite positions were known at the position of a receiver on earth uh, the position could be determined with the use of the doppler effect within the two years of the launch of sputnik the first five low altitude transitional satellite for the global navigation was launched in 1967 the first of three trimethan satellites demonstrated that a highly accurate clock could be carried out into the space in parallel with this effort. The 621B program was developed. Many of the current GPS characteristics are also run by the same program, which was developed at the same time. Next slide. In 1973, these parallel efforts were brought together into the now star global positioning system. All the performance parameters for the systems were verified during the ground testing by 1978. And during the same time, the 10 development satellites were launched. So they were launched successfully between 1978 and 1985. Now, currently, what's uh, the constellation of 24 satellites which we are looking, those were initially developed between 1989 and 1994 and the entire the gps now star system was considered fully operational in 1995 and in 2004 a new u.s national space based program of navigation and timing policy was released which currently is like constitute of our gps system we use on our day-to-day -day life billions of people benefits from the gps on daily basis whether using the modern communication that rely on gps timing flying in commercial or private aircraft navigating at the sea surveying mapping farming providing disaster relief support geolocating personal vehicle monitoring guiding heavy machinery and many more applications currently rely on the gps technology in agriculture sector the gpa the development and implementation of the precision agriculture and the farming has been made possible by combining the GPS and geographical information system, which is known as GIS. Today, the use of GPS allows more precise application of pesticides, herbicides, and fertilizers, and better control of the dispersion of those chemicals throughout the precision agriculture, thus reducing the expenses, producing a higher yield, and creating a more environmental friendly farm. In aviation sector, Mostly, we all may have taken a flight at some stage, correct? The use of GPS in civil aviation throughout the world has growing impact on increasing the safety and efficacy of global travel, as well as in the profitability of the industry. With its accurate, continuous and global capability, GPS offers seamless satellite navigational service that satisfies many of the requirements of the aviation user. Marine. GPS provides the fastest and most accurate method for mariners to navigate, measure speed, and determine location. This enables the increased level of safety and efficacy for ships and boats worldwide. Railroads. GPS ensures high level of safety by improving the efficiency of rail operations and expanding the system capacity. All are the key objective of today's railroad industry. Integral to the efficient operation of rail system is the requirement for accurate real-time position information of locomotives, rail car, maintenance of way vehicles and wayside equipments. All, all of these are possible with the use of GPS technology. Roads and highways. The availability of accuracy of the GPS offers increased efficiency and safety for vehicles using highway and streets and for mass transit systems. It is estimated 
that delays from congestion on the highway streets and the transit system throughout the world result in productivity losses in the hundreds of billions of dollars annually. Today, with the use of the GPS, we can select a road that is less congested and drive through seamlessly. Survey and mapping. GPS is rapidly being adopted as the standard by professional surveyor and mapping personnel throughout the world. Today, it is possible for a single surveyor using the GPS to accomplish in one day what used to take weeks with an entire team. Timing. Precise time is crucial to many business activities throughout the world. Communication system, electrical power grids, and financial network all rely on the precision timing for synchronization and operational efficiency. Today, GPS technology enables the use of atomic clock, which is delivered around the globe a simultaneous time and which is very important and very crucial for certain businesses. Environment. To sustain the Earth's environment while balancing human needs require better decision making with more up to date information. GPS now helps to address those needs. Now, meteorology. GPS technology also supports efforts to understand and, draw and forecast both the weather and changes in the environment by meteorologists by integrating GPS measurement into the operational method uh, used. GPS is being used to develop more accurate understanding of the water cycle, the role of water vapor in climate, which greatly improves the weather forecasting. Public safety and disaster relief. The use of GPS in public safety and disaster response to include the search and rescue has drastically changed this activity in fundamental ways and saved countless lives around the globe. Recreational. GPS has eliminated many of the hazards associated with the common recreational activity by providing a capability to determine a precise location. GPS receivers also have broadened the scope and, en scope and enjoyment of outdoor activities by simplifying many of the traditional problems, such as staying on the correct trail or recruiting to the best fishing spot. How can we forget the AFL? In summary, the GPS applications are by no means comprehensive in describing how GPS benefits the life of countless people around the world. Every day, new uses of the GPS are being discovered or invented and are limited to not only by the creativity and the, in the ingenuity of the human imaginations, our world has been drastically changed forever by GPS. No other single space project program or the system has led to human benefit that are even remotely close to that has, which has resulted from the GPS. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Chitani. Your presentation was invaluable and insightful. I can see questions already filling our chat. Please keep them coming as we have a planosphere to give away tonight. And now for a short news break. During the March visit to Australia, senior administrators from NASA, it was announced that two Australian space consortiums arose, the Australian Remote Operations for Space and Earth Consortium and EPE and Lunar Outpost Oceana Consortium have been selected to receive government funding of four million each to design early stage prototypes of semi-autonomous rovers. Australia's Trailblazer program includes the production of moon rovers that will collect samples of regolith, a soil, from the lunar surface. NASA will analyze this soil to determine if oxygen can be extracted and used to sustain a human presence on the moon and support future missions to Mars. The rovers are scheduled to be launched in 2026. We now have Jackie and she will be informing you about satellites and everyday life.
satellites in everyday life. There are thousands of satellites circling the Earth that help us every day, more than just GPS. The Probably the biggest group which are helping us every day are those that watch the weather. Of course, there's much more water on the Earth than land. So satellites help us see what's happening out there over the ocean. And it greatly helps us watch cyclones like this. But all the data they send back several times an hour over the last several decades has helped meteorologists improve their models so that we now get accurate four day forecasts. And you can know with some confidence whether it's going to be a hot or cold day a sunny or a windy day, whether it's a good day to stay home and read a book or whether you need to take an umbrella with you when you go out, whether to take that jacket with you because it's going to be cold later on or a warm sunny day where you need a hat and some sunscreen or even whether it's a good day to go boating or not. Satellites have always helped us with television as well. well not all our television comes via satellite. Uh, we do get a lot from our local services using the old aerials that look a bit like this. You might have a subscription service, but there's still some free to air content that does come via satellite, particularly sports. So if you like your football from Europe, and if you're enjoying the Ashes cricket test this weekend, that will definitely be coming via satellite, beaming down to some big dishes in Perth. And then that will come via cable to us in the eastern states. And every time you pay for something via a card and you just touch it on, that is also using a satellite. The finance industry is well connected across the world often timing their transactions to the millisecond. And this is why there is some concern every so often you will hear a story about when the next big solar flare might hit. It could take out the satellites and we wouldn't be able to pay for anything. Now, we just don't know when this might happen. Uh, it's, it is a possibility, a very real possibility. Uh, because we are all connected via the satellites, but it may or may not happen. We don't know, but there's many satellites up there working away, sending a starter, watching what's going on down below and helping us all stay connected. Thank you, Jackie, for sharing your expertise and insights. Next up is Ella, and she will be explaining how space technologies have led to advances in renewable energy. And welcome to another one of my talks for MBO. Tonight I'm going to be telling you all about how space technologies have led to advances in renewable energy. So in 2023, energy is a massive topic of conversation in our daily lives. As our planet gets hotter, we as a race are not really helping this. And in fact, we are amplifying this process. This is partially due to the amount of energy we consume and the products that are produced on this. The average Victorian home uses around 20 kilowatt hours of energy per day, or 7,000 kilowatt hours of electricity per year. And with this energy usage, we as a nation produce about seven tons of carbon dioxide in each of our homes every single year. In Australia, most of our energy consumption comes from fossil fuels, a whopping total 93% of it. However, by as early as 2025, renewable energy sources are set to overtake this more destructive form of energy that we are primarily using nowadays, in which renewable energy will become the largest source of global energy. Now you may be wondering, what does the space industry have to do with this? Little did you know, space technologies have played a significant role in the advancement of renewable energy here on Earth, in which the space sector is a major forerunner in the expansion of renewable energy. Some of these include solar panels, remote sensing and Earth observation. 
Let's have a look at some of these technologies we have adapted from a little closer. The very first solar panel was invented by Charles Fritz in 1883, where he coated a thin layer of selenium with an extremely thin layer of gold. The resulting cells that had come from this had a conversion of electrical efficiency of only 1%. Little as this was, this invention led to the launching of a movement for producing solar energy. In the 21st century, after the continued discovery and development of silicone and other PV materials, solar panels provide electricity to millions of houses worldwide. They power entire buildings, the satellites in space, and continue to provide clean energy all around the world, as they do not produce air pollution or greenhouse gases when operating. In the space sector, they must use solar panels on their spacecraft and satellites to generate energy in space where the primary source of energy is most obviously the sun. At a temperature of up to 15 million degrees and a diameter of roughly 1.4 million kilometres, there isn't a lack of energy source in this day of age. As solar panels become more efficient at converting sunlight into energy, they are going to completely dominate energy supply in the future. As previously discussed, renewable energy sources such as solar, wind, hydro and biomass have gained increasingly popularity as alternative energy sources. Remote sensing technologies are used in obtaining basic information for decision making in the use of renewable energy, in which are used in monitoring and finding areas for, with, with renewable resources so infra infrastructure can be built, such as hydropower, solar power and wind power. These sensors can be broken down into two different types, passive and active sensors. Passive sensors measure existing light levels. These sorts of sensors can only be operated in environments with measurable levels of light. If light levels are too low, the sensors will not be able to collect information. On the other hand, active sensors send out a signal that illuminates the surface and measure the properties of the returning signal. Active sensors require more energy than passive sensors, as they provide their own signal to measure, in which this comes with an advantage. An active sensor has a greater operational flexibility range, meaning they can operate in dimmer light conditions. These sensors can be attached to various types of platforms, in which the platforms are divided into three categories. Ground-based, which are mounted on a platform that stays in contact with the ground, Airborne, these sensors are generally mounted on planes, or in some cases on hot air balloons. And finally, spaceborne, these sensors are mounted on satellites within our atmosphere. Thanks to the development of these sensors, the process of accessing renewable energy sources gets easier every single day. Our final topic of discussion is about Earth observation, in which this plays a crucial role in the advancement in renewable energy. They provide insights and disclose information about the Earth's surface and the atmosphere, also the global temperature. Satellites equipped with specialised equipment and sensors, very much like the ones I just mentioned, help to provide information about the availability of resources, in which can be used for ecological sustainability purposes, such as solar radiation hotspots, wind patterns and ocean currents. Similarly, Satellites can be used to determine the environmental impacts of renewable energy installations and whether these areas may be improving from the damage caused by increased greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and the increased carbon footing we are also generously providing our Earth with. Earth observation can also determine climate modelling, which is vital in order to understand whether a use of renewable energy sources is making a long-term impact. By studying these climate patterns, scientists can continue to find places and create new technologies to ensure the growth of renewable energy resources. With it estimated that renewables being set to account for almost 95% of the global power capacity from 2026, it ensures a cleaner and brighter future for generations to come. Thanks to Charles Fitz for the creation of the solar panel, remote sensors, and satellites for global observation, technologies all designed for space are helping us down here on Earth 
to reduce our use of fossil fuel consumption and replacing them with renewable energy resources as our global energy consumption. So do your part and help us create a greener future. My name is Ella and I hope you have a great rest of the night. Thank you, Ella, for delivering a memorable and impactful presentation. Stay tuned for our final news break. On April 20 this year, a solar eclipse was witnessed live by approximately 20,000 people in and around the town of Exmouth in Western Australia. The time and date live stream recorded more than 10 million online viewers. Intrepid MBO eclipsophile Steve Delisle traveled to Exmouth to experience and record this amazing event. Find out more about the Ningaloo and Future Eclipses on these websites. And finally, we have Merv talking about materials designed for space. Merv here. I'm just bringing you a few materials that were NASA spin off stuff that was developed for space and redesigned for use on Earth. In the very early days of the space program, NASA realized that due to the vast temperatures in space, they needed thermal protection for both their equipment and the astronauts. NASA's Marshall Space Center worked with the National Metallizing Corporation and created the first sun shields, made from a thin plastic film covered in a metallic reflecting agent, which was usually aluminum. The result was a metallized polyethylene tetrathylate, or M. PET. The product was excellent at stabilizing widely variable temperatures by reflecting infrared heat away or conserve heat as a passive warming system. And so the thermal blanket from space became the space blanket we use on Earth, purchased quite cheaply nowadays as an emergency blanket to keep in the back of your car. These things are basically mylar. They're used for first aid, safety, weather, shock, and wrapped around a person just to normalize body, body temperature. Keeping on the temperature regulating idea, NASA needed a coating to protect space planes heat shields during atmosphere re-entry, part of a proposed 1990 space program. NASA's Ames Research Center in Silicon Valley patented the protective coating for ceramic materials uh, known as PCCM. It's not a regular insulator. It's not a reflective. Instead, it has a remarkably high emissive, emissivity, meaning it could absorb heat from a heat shield and radiate it away from the spacecraft. <clears throat> the coating designed for space plane surface is paper thin and will radiate heat away from the tiles underneath. What started out as spacecraft protection was changed into a yarn eventually. And this came about through, first of all, Emmisfield Inc., formerly Wessex Inc., who licensed the technology or, or the formula for PCCM. And they redeveloped that into different coatings for equipment that was used around the world. Following that, a Florida business wanted to enter the high-tech fabrics and heard of PCCN. And they got an exclusive license to make fabrics in exchange for a brand share. <clears throat> in 2015, Trizar started turning out cold weather jackets that could emit body heat back to the wearer. Advancements were used in jeans, sportswear, face masks, etc. Trizar also have a low emissive formula for hot weather to reflect heat away from the body. 
and keep people cool. Development to incorporate Tri's RMT yarn created a lighter cloth and was taken up by several companies such as O'Neill for ski jackets, Forho for hunting gear, Artelex Studios for ski jackets and pants, Cajus for jacket liners, Ergo Mix for hot and cold weather apparel, Levi jeans sold in East Asia, New Balance sports uniforms and many many more. Continuing the fabric theme, one other item that NASA needed was a fire resistant fabric from the 1950s at the beginning of the space program right through to the 1980s, NASA sought to have a reliable fire resistant fabric for spacesuits and space vehicles. Polybenzamazidol or PBI was a result of high temperature stable polymer. The stiff fibers also maintained their integrity when exposed to high heat and were mildew, abrasion and chemical resistant <clears throat> that could be used for spacesuits. Ongoing research in the 1970s with the PBI material saw its introduction to the fire service in the United States. The new material PBI Gold was a new fabric used on the firefighters turnout gear. In 1983 PBI fibers were also made commercially available from a production plant in South Carolina. The PBI flame resistant fabric is now used by firefighters around the world. <clears throat> New applications for PBI continue to be used with aerospace, plus it's into motorsports, the military, a flame resistant workwear for electrical utility workers. It's also used in high temperature separation membranes, such as specialized equipment like hydrogen fuel cells. It is also found a safe and effective and perfect replacement for asbestos. When it comes to astronauts needing to leave their spacecraft and perform extravehicular activities, NASA needed a tough non-scratch and reflective visor for the astronaut. Protection from the sun's glare, solar wind and possible dust or debris damage was necessary. The filtering and reflective materials designed for helmet visors was supreme at the task. Inside spacecraft like the ISS, the sunglasses worn by astronauts are considerably darker than commercial lenses, gold coated to protect against ultraviolet and infrared rays. The sunglasses do not have screws etc that could become loose and interfere with equipment or become a choking hazard for the astronaut. A variety of companies have licensed NASA technology for commercial advancement in sunshade where NASA's <coughs> optical filtering tech is now used in ski goggles to filter out the blue light scatter that creates a haze around mountainsides and ski slopes. It allows visible light while blocking harmful wavelengths. Polarizing lenses coupled with the harmful blue, violet and ultraviolet blocking layers provide a much improved vision. Welding Curtain is another JPL spin-off that absorbs, filters and scatters light from the welding process. Welding goggles soon followed. Uh, there's a jolly good question. Are airless tires a Moon and Mars vehicle spin-off? Well, from the early days of needing transport on the Moon to moving rovers around Mars, NASA has been engaged with the industry research centers to create the perfect wheel. Airless, robust, unable to withstand fast temperature swings on the moon or extreme cold of Mars <clears throat> and still have a driving grip over soft sand or dust and rough sharp rocks or ice. Current designs led toward a woven wire mesh, nickel titanium, is a shape memory alloy technology. Here on Earth, the design teams are reworking these concepts for use on regular vehicles. New designs are underway with several tire manufacturers for cars, trucks, earth movers, motorbikes and bicycles. <clears throat> some are in the wire mesh design. Some lean towards new flexible rubber compounds that incorporates the curved flexible spokes. The smart tire company are working with NASA for new moon and Mars rovers and several vehicle manufacturers. Memory foam. Why did NASA need that in space? 
well, the original development in 1966 between NASA and the North American Aviation Inc. designed for NASA's aircraft seats to keep the test pilots cushioned during flights. It was later used on the space shuttle seats. The designer lost out on being able to file his patents by one day. <clears throat> NASA released a formula for temper foam to the public domain in 1980. Ah, memory foam. Better known to NASA as temper foam, and is probably the best known spin off from NASA's many developments. Memory foam has the ability to absorb shocks, improve comfort by evening out pressure points. It flowed to match the body shape and slowly returns to its original form when pressure is removed. Memory foam has many uses, including vehicle seats, cycle seats, transport seating, saddles and wheelchair padding, sofas, photons, not forgetting mattresses, not forgetting pillows to go with your mattress, headphone cushions, earplugs, and much, much more. Well, thank you very much for listening and watching through your blue light reducing spectacles while wrapped in your temperature regulating clothing and lounging on your memories foam sofa. And just one addendum to Jet's little talk earlier. In 2013, on the Spike TV Guys Choice Awards, Buzz Aldrin admitted to the audience that Tang sucks. Thank you, Merv, for enlightening us with your presentation. Well, that was the last of our speakers for this evening, but stick around to learn more about who we are and what MBO is about before we head into questions and answers. Mount Bennett Observatory is a community-run astronomical society in the Dandenong Ranges. We are completely volunteer-run and have over 500 members. We focus on community engagement, outreach, diversity, and helping our members to get the most out of their love of space and astronomy. The observatory was originally built by Monash University for students to do astronomical research, especially on variable stars, stars whose brightness changes over time. Over the next two decades, the site was expanded and upgraded but eventually took a back seat to modern giant internet connected observatories around the world. In 2011, our five founding members reached an agreement with the landowners and took over the lease and established the society. Now we run over 80 events each year, including members nights, public viewings and special events. We have several special interest groups, including deep sky observing, radio astronomy, astrophotography, astro arts, and young observers. In 2020, we expanded our online presence and now host regular live streaming events. We welcome all new members and love making new friends with other astronomy lovers. You will be joining a friendly community of passionate, hard-working amateurs who have a grand vision for the future of the observatory. We hope to see you up at MBO soon. Hello everyone. We hope you are enjoying the stream. Coming up next is the question and answer segment, but first, some important messages. MBO is a volunteer-run organisation. If you'd like to support us, consider becoming a member, buying some MBO merch, or making a donation. You can find us on social media at these addresses. The live streams are created by a talented and diverse team. You can read the names of those involved below.
Now it's time for Q&A. I now invite all the panellists to join me for our Q&A segment. Okay, now that we're all here, the first question tonight is from Dot. If there are lots of satellites out there, how do they avoid hitting each other? Anybody know? Well, I, I can take that one. Um, space is big. <laughs> there is an awful lot of space up there. Uh, most satellites are reasonably small. You can imagine the biggest ones being about the size of a, a small bus, um, the majority of them being about the size of a car or smaller. Um, there are a lot of them up there, but imagine Australia only having, say, you know, 20,000 cars and they're spread evenly across all of Australia. Well, that's similar to how many satellites there are, and they're spread out over the entire diameter radius of the Earth. So um, they do occasionally come close to each other, and sometimes um, when there's actually been a collision, which does rarely happen, um, there can be lots of debris created. So you end up getting uh, tens of thousands of much smaller pieces and those small pieces, because they're traveling so fast, they can actually do quite a bit of damage. So the satellites themselves generally avoid each other quite well. But if they do hit, and some satellites have been actually destroyed deliberately by nations practicing uh, anti-satellite weaponry, which I think is a terrible, terrible thing, um, then you can create a, a scattergun effect of all the, the uh, particles from those. And there's actually a... Um, a, a frightening theory that suggests that perhaps one day um, there might be a cascade effect from a single event. So one satellite gets destroyed by a, a country or collides with another satellite and one or two pieces from that debris actually end up destroying another satellite and then one or two pieces from those destroy the next satellite. And it, you end up with a cascade effect where all of the satellites in orbit get destroyed and the entire near-Earth orbit space is completely filled with space junk. It's called Kessler syndrome. And if that ever happened, then essentially we would lose not only all the benefits we've talked about tonight from satellites, but also the ability to go to space because you'd be trying to launch through this incredible uh, shotgun effect of all these different particles in, in orbit. So um, yeah, they do avoid each other, mostly sp uh, satellites do, but um, if we're not careful in the future and if we don't stop some satellite uh, countries in the future from trying to destroy satellites in orbit, then we might find ourselves in a, a much worse situation than we are in now. Thank you, Neil, and stay with me. This next question mm -hmm. you might be able to answer as well. In, mm -hmm. And it is also our winning answer for the evening and it's by Andrea. And the question is, what's going to happen when all of the satellites reach their use by use by date as there's so many up there now? Well, congratulations, Andrea. That is a great question. And it leads on nicely from the, uh, the what I was just talking about. So we've got two or three different types of orbits. So we've got low Earth orbit. They're the satellites that are very near to the surface of the Earth, like the International Space Station and the Hubble. Um, you've got... Um, some medium distance ones, there's not too many of those, but then you've got beyond that, you've got geosynchronous satellites and they are way, way out. Oh, hello, Aki, thank you. <laughs> they are way, way out and um, they are there for the long term. So in order to stay in geosynchronous orbit, they have to be traveling very fast and they stay in the same place over the earth. So their orbit generally won't change in time. And so when they die, or when they run out of fuel, they get moved slightly out of that geosynchronous orbit into what's called a parking orbit. And so essentially there's a, a bit of a, a belt around the Earth of old defunct satellites. Now, those, those ones aren't really very dangerous because they are well out of the, the ranges of uh, where satellites are actually still functioning. But low Earth orbit, there's a problem there in that 
when you are that low to the surface of the earth, there is still very, very thin atmosphere up there. And that thickness of the atmosphere varies depending on how far away you are from the Earth. So, for example, the Starlink satellites being launched by SpaceX, they're all being put into an orbit that's low enough that if something were to ever happen to them, they break down, they run out of fuel, whatever, then within five years, the drag from the upper atmosphere would be sufficient to bring their orbit down to burn up in the atmosphere. And that's what happens with a lot of space junk. So whenever you see big satellite launches go up, uh, a lot of the components that are involved in sending them up, they end up in orbits that decay, that end up being burnt up in the atmosphere. And when they burn up, they really burn up. Very little actually remains uh, to the surface. But there are other satellites that won't go to that, um, to have that fate. They're high enough up in low Earth orbit that when they stop functioning, they will stay in orbit for a very, very long time. So it's a big problem. Uh, we, we don't want to keep adding junk to space without having a way to get rid of it. So there's a lot of uh, um, countries and universities and other groups who are working on technologies to either refuel old satellites so that they can extend their lifespan or to capture them and bring them back down to a lower orbit where it will decay and be destroyed. So that is a very expensive option because you are spending a lot of money to launch these satellites up there in the first place and then launch other satellites up there to refuel or capture them. But given the issue of the potential Kessler syndrome in the future, that is something we should probably factor into the costs of the missions from the very start. You know, at the moment, there's no real governing laws across the entire world that everyone has to follow, but maybe we do need some sort of space exploration treaty that all nations that are involved in the space exploration race uh, act in ethical ways so that they don't destroy satellites and they have full life cycle plans for how to deal with these satellites when they retire. Thank you, Neil. And thank you, Andrea, for your winning question. Could you please provide us with your details by using the email prizes at mbo.org.au so that we can send your planosphere out to you? Wow. Space, the ultimate frontier, has always captivated our imagination. It is a realm of limitless possibilities where the boundaries of what we thought were possible are continuously pushed. But beyond its sheer grandeur, space has also proven to be an incubator of groundbreaking technologies that have transformed our lives in countless ways. They have revolutionised our lives from satellite communications to weather forecasting, GPS navigation and renewable energy. Let us carry their legacy forward, embracing innovation and the boundless possibilities that lie within the cosmos. As we bring this event to a close, I want to thank all of you for joining us on this journey and onward we soar. Good night.